right. So uh, you're stuck with me for a second week in a row. Uh, I'm taking care of my obligations to the department, trying to <laughs> early in the academic year. So today we're going to review uh, a little bit about respiratory syncytial virus. And uh, for most of you, this is a uh, routine topic. And for those of you who are students with us, this will be on your exam. So uh, this hopefully will be a good review for you. And we'll talk a little bit about what's new with RSV and the things that uh, are especially happening on the research side of our department uh, that pertain to this coming winter. So uh, we'll review a little bit of RSV itself and then discuss advances in antiviral therapies and also advances in prevention of RSV so that you will be as up to date as you can. So. Um, a lot of what we know about RSV can, comes from work of Caroline Breeze Hall and other people in the pediatric infectious disease community. And this was a, uh, an important article in the New England Journal from 2009 that really helped uh, uh, bring to um, uh, crystallization the, the data on the burden of respiratory syncytial virus infection in young children. And there are a few important parts here. Um, one is that you know, the rates of infection vary over time. And so in the far right column here, you have the, uh, let's see, this is rates of inpatient and outpatient treatment for kids under five with confirmed RSV from 2000 to 2004. And you can see those rates are about 3, 2, 3.7, and 3 per thousand children uh, overall in kids less than five. But when you break it down by age groups, two to five year olds, one to two year olds, six to 11 month olds, and zero to five month olds, it becomes very clear that the vast majority of these cases occur in the zero to five month age group. And so we, we know that that's the, the age when kids are exposed to RSV, most likely to get RSV, and also most likely to be hospitalized with RSV. And those rates in the first half uh, half year of life are somewhere between three and four times the rates of kids in the second half year of life. Okay, so the risk goes down dramatically after six months of age for normal healthy children. And that'll be important when we look at prevention of RSV strategies because most of the prevention strategies that we're going to talk about are focused on premature infants who have even higher rates of RSV infection. The other important thing, or, or this also crystallized in a graphic form, that really the number one factor is age. Uh, less than five months uh, old is the highest risk group, and the odds ratio for infection is somewhere around 16 uh, compared to the kids older than five years of age. So uh, this is the prime time that we're focused on RSV. Uh, one of the difficulties of RSV, and numerous physicians and scientists have spent their entire careers trying to develop vaccines against RSV, and have had no success. And, and that's been a real challenge uh, uh, before really the molecular age and our ability to uh, use molecular engineering techniques to construct novel types of viruses. But the traditional virus or vaccine development pathways like for measles, a, a fairly closely related virus to RSV, just did not work for RSV. And in fact, in some cases, uh, made RSV worse. So we won't spend a lot of time on the the history of RSV vaccines because what's exciting is what's what's coming down the pipeline. All right, third year students, where are you? All right, is RSV uh, an RNA virus or a DNA virus? RNA virus, right? Okay, single strand or multi stranded? Single strand, right? Positive sense or negative sense? Negative sense, okay, that's all right. And the importance of, the, of that is that um, antivirals that work against some viruses don't work against others very well, okay? And so the antivirals we're gonna be talking about for RSV, uh, one, some are, are polymerase inhibitors and, and others are fusion inhibitors, and these are the two major classes that, uh, that we're gonna focus on. And, and those are important, you know, knowing what the virus, how the virus is made is important to predict what might be useful as an antiviral. I'll leave it that way. All right, so our epidemiology, you're well aware of. 
In children younger than a year of age, RSV is the most common cause of bronchiolitis and pneumonia. Uh, when infants are exposed for the first time, somewhere around 25 to 40 percent get sick, and uh, 5 to 20 out of 1,000, or, or somewhere up to 2 percent, we'll say, require hospitalization. And as pointed out by the first article, the most hospitalizations occur in kids younger than six months of age. Now, strategies for protecting those kids, of course, it could include active immunization if we had a good vaccine, but also passive immunization. And one thing we won't be talking about today is, or I guess a secondary immunization, immunized mom during pregnancy. So we use, for instance, Tdap to protect babies against pertussis in the early part of their life. Um, and there are a lot of folks working on RSV vaccines where we actually vaccinate the mom during the third trimester so that we can protect the infant. We won't be talking about those vaccines today. Uh, we're just actually going to touch on vaccines a little bit. Um, we know that infants and children infected with RSV usually show symptoms for four to six days. Most are better within a couple of weeks. In older uh, adults or patients with weakened immune systems, the virus may persist for one to three weeks and be shed and spread all around the community. The costs of RSV in the United States are fairly high in terms of numbers of hospitalizations, about over, or well over 50,000 hospitalizations per year, uh, over 2 million outpatient visits per year, and really surprising when, when I was looking at some of the data is over 175,000 hospitalizations and 14,000 deaths among adults older than age 65. So, you know, some of our faculty have to start getting worried about this. You know? So, um, but this, this is a, a group that's, that's not traditionally had to worry about RSV. Um, <laughs> just saying, you know. <laughs> this group has not traditionally had to worry about RSV, and especially as, you know, this is probably related to immune senescence, um, um, long-term care facilities, a lot of, a lot of complex issues uh, as, as you advance in your years, but also immune-compromised patients uh, due to chemotherapy, bone marrow transplant, all those are another huge group of patients at risk for RSV and who have high morbidity and mortality. RSV we know is seasonal. We call it a wintertime illness, and uh, this is, shows the, uh, the months of the year with most highest prevalence of RSV by region of the Department of Health and Human Services, and we're closest to the Dallas region. And, and our RSV season typically starts in late November or early December and spreads out till March or April. Uh, Florida has a skewed season because of its uh, tropical climate and probably a lot of other factors that we don't know about. And uh, the, the duration of this season in Florida, though, even though it's out to eight to nine months in some, some years, um, the recommendations that you'll see for prevention of RSV in our preemies still say five doses. You don't have to dose the entire season. You're going you're to benefit from uh, a maximal benefit from five doses. So we'll move on to that. How do we diagnose RSV? Uh, well, most people in, in private practice settings are going to use antigen detection tests because they're rapid and uh, cheap relative to other things and they're clear waved and that means that non-technical staff or our relatively untrained staff can do those. You don't have to have a laboratory technician to do those. And um, culture has always been the gold standard, but the antigen uh, culture is actually very difficult to find a place that will do culture now. These are reliable in young children, mostly because they have very high viral loads of RSV. So when there's a lot of RSV around out of a kid's nose, it's pretty easy to detect it. But they're not so reliable in our older children and adults where pre-existing immunity keeps the viral load lower, okay? So they lose a little bit of sensitivity uh, in, in the uh, older children and adults. And in our setting, and with a recommendation in, in other settings where you need higher sensitivity, is to use RT-PCR processes. These are reverse transcriptase PCR assays, and they're extremely sensitive. And you guys are all well aware of the tests we're using here. The film array, or uh, made by made by uh, BioMariu, that is a respiratory panel that includes 20 different pathogens, uh, a few bacteria over here, pertussis, chlamydiophila, and mycoplasma, plus RSV and influenza substrains, parainfluenzas, metanumo, another problem virus there, adenos and corona. So you get a whole panel for an awful lot of money and 
consequently, we as, as sort of agents of public health at times get an awful lot of data uh, related to what's circulating in the community. <clears throat> and what that data looks like is pretty fascinating. Uh, this is just from one particular week last year in, in mid-December, and I get a, a breakdown every week uh, from the laboratory of the age, gender, and uh, virus collected from different patients. And for instance, here in this patient, you can see here's a nine-month-old who had a male who had both coronavirus and human metanumovirus. Uh, move down here. Here is a child with two different coronaviruses. A lot of RSV smattered in here. Here's a 16-year-old with RSV. Up here, let's see, there's somebody else. There was an older patient with RSV somewhere also. Yeah, there's a three-year-old with mycoplasma, three-year-old with RSV at the same time. Here's some more data. Here's these kids uh, down here, 12 and 13 month olds. These are, these are siblings, one with paraflu, one with RSV, a lot of RSVs down here, and two-year-old kids. These are from all over the city, emergency rooms, hospitalized patients, uh, not just our hospital. And so we really can get a good sense of, of what's circulating in the community. What we found in, in analysis of this data, not only can we look at the epidemiologic curve, but we can also look at how common are co-infections. And it looks like somewhere between a third and a half of kids who have RSV will have another virus, uh, a respiratory virus, positive on their panel at the same time. And it can be any of the others. Does that make RSV particularly worse? No. There's not any clinical evidence that those viruses or the clinical presentation of the combined infection is any worse than, than RSV by itself. Is it possible that they had something and it's gone, but they still have a positive PCR and now they have something else? Sure. It's possible that, that what you're picking up is the tail end of one infection and a new infection coming on, uh, because especially kids who are in the virologic cesspool of daycare will have multiple exposures, uh, you know, every day. And so the, the excretion of, or the, de the detectability of RSV, even though it may not be transmissible, it gets out to at least seven to ten days and sometimes two weeks, depending. Okay? So as long as there's snot in the nose, assume it is infectious. Okay, so that's the first stage, review of a little bit of RSV. This is uh, some pictures from my trip to Costa Rica a couple of years ago. Uh, the capuchin uh, monkey, the toucan, and some of the beautiful uh, flowers of that area. Uh, bromeliads, in fact. Okay, what's in the pipeline for RSV antiviral agents? As I alluded to earlier, they're mostly focused on two classes, fusion inhibitors and polymerase inhibitors. And if you remember back to your virology, the fusion protein is one of the surface proteins on the outside of the virus. It does exactly what its name says, fusion. It helps the virus envelope fuse with the cell membrane. It also causes the syncytia formation of cell-to-cell -cell fusion in RSV infection. And the polymerase does exactly what its name implies. It helps to uh, both uh, cause replication and transcription of the RSV uh, virus. And there are some interesting techniques, just one I wanted to highlight, that are being used now to, to search for antivirals. In this case, uh, researchers have made two different um, or in this case, use two different viruses. One is an, RS, uh, is an RSV virus that has a fluorescent tag on it that is yellow in this diagram. And they've made a flu virus that is, has a green tag on it, a green fluorescent uh, tag. And they actually use both viruses in the same cell culture system in, in a, a microassay where they can look at the fluorescence that comes out and know if a compound that they've added to that is inhibitory of RSV flu, or both, based on what, how much fluorescence they read for each, um, uh, each different color. And in doing this type of thing, you, you, get to, you can screen thousands and thousands of different compounds to look for antiviral activity. And I don't expect you to read this, but uh, there is, you know, the first group shown here are, are uh, agents that have some RSV predominance in terms of inhibiting the virus production. And, there are some of the drugs that we use. Here's rosaglitazone, and uh, used in adult medicine. Atoposide, yeah, incristine. We wouldn't use drugs like that because they sound like chemotherapy, right? But it gives us clues that some of these things, topoisomerase inhibitors and the like, 
if we, if we could alter those and change their safety profile a little bit, we may have an opportunity for uh, some really good antiviral agents. And that's what the, the, the biologic chemists take into the laboratory is a starting place to say, okay, here's the amount of RSV inhibition we get with a topicide, but we don't like its safety profile. Let's see if we can keep the RSV activity, but improve its safety profile by altering its side chains and those things. So um, these types of, of assays are more and more generating from old medicines often uh, new uses and repurposing and, and derivatization for um, uh, things that we're looking for, antivirals in particular. Okay, so we'll talk about um, three different antivirals that are all in clinical trials right now. The first one is, uh, has, has, uses its old name, GS5806, and this is from Gilead Sciences. This is the, the diagram of the compound. And its uh, new name for scientific purpose is Presetovir, Presetovir. And this compound is a fusion inhibitor, so it binds to the fusion protein of RSV, and um, in doing so, stops the spread of the virus. So this is some initial data that they published in the most common used animal model for RSV, which is a cotton rat model, asking at different doses of of the medication, how big of a reduction in viral load can you get in the nasal wash and in the lung lavage? And the important thing here is that with highest dose, 30 milligrams per kilo, you get not quite uh, one log reduction in the nasal wash, but you get almost a two log reduction in the lung lavage, so that its effects are deeper in the lungs where it has more clinically important effects as opposed to the upper respiratory tract uh, where it's more of a nuisance than, than anything. And in human studies, this is a study of healthy volunteers where they experimentally infect them with RSV strains and then treat them with either placebo, and in this case high dose or low dose of, of Presetovir. And those who got placebo had maximum viral loads out here at day four and five, up to five logs of, of virus, and this is in nasal secretions. And those who were treated with high dose and low dose, you can see that their viral loads peaked, well, somewhere around day one or two, and were maintained very low over, this was, I think, a five-day treatment course, and, and basically prevented this very large spike in production of the virus. And this particular agent, uh, Gilead, is focusing on its use in stem cell transplant patients and mostly in the adult populations for, um, for treatment of RSV, and it will probably also be used, uh, or at least attempted to use in prophylactic context for RSV during the winter time. So an exciting drug, and as I said, it's in human trials, especially in adults who are immune compromised. Uh, second inhibitor, this is a polymerase inhibitor. The company that makes this is called Alios Biopharma, and here's the uh, the uh, molecular uh, formula there of what it, or diagram of what it actually looks like. And these are some of the other compounds that were, that were starting materials to, to derivatize to lead to this ultimately most successful compound. This compound is, is really a nucleoside analog. And as such, it has a real high bar for um, safety because we want to make sure any nucleoside analog is not uh, going to cause mutations that can lead to cancer and other long-term problems. And so uh, this drug, Alios, is working through, in, it's in clinical trials in adults and children for uh, treatment of RSV. And we actually have the, a protocol here related to this drug that will be, uh, it was open last year and will also be open through this winter for treatment of infants um, uh, with RSV in the hospital. They can't be former preemies. And what's nice about this drug is, is it's an oral drug. And so uh, dosing is very simple, either once or twice a day uh, for five days. And what this looks like in terms of its, of its um, uh, patient flow, we're looking at, uh, well, this, I'll show you some challenge data first. They infected healthy volunteers and looked at the effects of, of this drug on the progression of their RSV. Here they used a Q12 hour dosing for five days, but we know it has a very long half-life and daily dosing would be adequate. 
Um, these were young, healthy, predominantly males, 71% males, average age 22 years, years old. And much like the curve I showed you before on the fusion inhibitor, here's the viral load in the nasal secretions starting at the first dose of study drug. Those who got placebo had a peak viral load around day four or five and a peak in misery uh, shortly thereafter. And those who got the drug, you can see that it very rapidly shut down uh, virus production and that, that low, uh, low to zero virus production was maintained over the five-day course of drug. So again, you've got a very potent inhibitor of RSV that uh, safety profile, at least in the studies that have been done so far, looks, looks very promising. Uh, very few side effects, and those that have been reported are minor, things like nausea and vomiting. Well, those would go with RSV also. And um, the reduction in viral load, you can see here with the placebo. Let's see, here's the viral load uh, area under the curve. Uh, this is what the placebo group has. If you sum, sum up all of the virus load over the time course, it's over 500. And in those with the high dose of medication, you can see it's about a 90% uh, increase in the viral load AUC. Time to non-detectability of virus was just one to two days with the drug compared to seven days uh, with the placebo. So that's part of the answer to your question, Dr. Broussard. But remember, these are healthy adults who have had RSV in the past. They were all seropositive, so that influences their excretion. And you can see their peak viral loads uh, were two to three logs with the drug, but uh, over five logs as I showed you in the curve uh, with the placebo. They actually uh, weighed the Kleenex that each person used to uh, get a sense of the daily mucus weight uh, produced during the time course of this infection. And you can see those, here's, here's where the peak of misery is, about day four to five. Um, and we're talking about uh, four, three to four grams of mucus per day at uh, peak misery in the placebo group compared to uh, one or less in the uh, treatment groups. So uh, even some very important measures of uh, antiviral success and treatment success are uh, easily quantifiable by just weighing out all those tissues. And the to here's the total mucus weight over time, over 18 grams uh, in the placebo group and only three to six grams in the um, uh, treatment groups. So, you know, this is pediatrics, right? We can talk about mucus weight, I guess. All right, so that drug's in trials, and, and we're a site for, uh, for that drug uh, this year. Third antiviral that I'll point out is, is, a, is a real fascinating one. It's a little different. It's, it's called a nanobody. It's much more like, an, it's like an antibody in the sense that it is a biologic agent. And um, it is in these in vitro studies compared to palivizumab, which is Synergis, a monoclonal, humanized monoclonal antibody used to uh, prevent RSV in uh, premature infants. This drug is uh, being developed by a company called Ablinx, and Ablinx has uh, a very novel strategy. Well, why is this called an, a nanobody, not, a, um, not an antibody? And I'll show you. The nanobodies are actually uh, derived in animals of the camelid species, which would include llamas, camels, alpacas, and the like. And they make an interesting uh, type of antibody that only contains the heavy chain. So here's what our conventional antibody like Synergist would look like, or rituximab, or pick your antibody. Heavy chain and, and conserved regions, and then light chain uh, attached here out to the side, but these, these particular animals make only a, a, a heavy chain antibody. And that means it's much smaller and it can, um, is more amenable to chemical modification in the sense that you can link several of these together and make them uh, multipotent. They can actually have, you can link several together that actually have different targets. And you could use these uh, in, in some interesting ways, and the company's working on this too, use them to deliver drugs or other, other things to particular sites of the body based on the reactivity of this variable region. So this variable region acts like an antibody variable region in terms of its specificity, um, but it doesn't carry as, as large of a protein frame and, and therefore it's not as immunogenic and, and not as problematic in terms of, of reactivity. And as I said, uh, this company uses llamas 
and they can produce a wide uh, diversity of nanobodies so that they may not they may actually have three different nanobody uh, reactivities all reactive to different parts of the RSV fusion protein and in doing so have a very high threshold for resistance because we know that if you only if you use a monoclonal antibody that only reacts to one area of a protein the virus can mutate that area or may end up with mutations in that area and select for uh, a, a resistant variant. But in this case, when you have multiple points of, of attack against the virus fusion protein with this kind of strategy, you, the likelihood of resistance goes down dramatically. So they, uh, again, compare their drug to palivizumab just in its reactivity. This is a trivalent uh, nanobody, they call it, and um, compare it to different a and B strains of RSV, because remember, although for clinical purposes, RSV is RSV is RSV, molecularly we know we can distinguish A and B strains, and look at the reactivity of different strains to palivizumab compared to the uh, anti-RSV nanobody, and you can see that they, they use 61 strains overall. Palivizumab is only reactive against eight, uh, uh, 80, 18 of those, 18 percent of those, or 11 whereas the nanobody was reactive to 87%, so about a five-fold increase in the, just the number of strains in the bank that, uh, that this nanobody can react to. Um, and that may give it more broad activity against more different circulating strains of, of RSV, and as we already talked about, against palivizumab resistant strains of RSV. So this drug is also uh, in clinical trials in infants, this drug is an inhaled drug, which is, was kind of a surprise to me, because remember, it's a biologic, but uh, its delivery is by nebulization, much like, um, like we use routinely in the pediatric practices. And it's been used in studies in a uh, lamb model of RSV, as well as human adult trials, and shown very high efficacy in reducing viral load and, uh, and really shutting down the spread of virus in the lungs. And the advantage, potential advantage here with this drug is it could be used prophylactically uh, in a pre-exposure prophylaxis kind of setting. Okay, so that's the, the rundown on a few antivirals. This is uh, from my recent trip to Peru. You can see even in Peru, uh, pediatrics and uh, geriatrics get shunted off to a different place from, uh, you know, everything. It's not, it's separate, but probably not equal, much like well, what we experience every day. All right, so how do we prevent RSV? Well, for most everybody, the CDC poster here on the right is, is the answer. Avoid close contact, cover your coughs and sneezes, wash your hands, avoid touching your face, clean and disinfect surfaces, and stay home when you're sick. All the routine things we do for every other virus, very nonspecific for uh, related to RSV. This is respiratory viruses in general. So. What I'd like to uh, discuss briefly is, is palivizumab and how we should be using palivizumab. And I think we're doing a, a fairly good job doing that. Uh, couple, another antibody that is available, and then we'll touch on some of the vaccines that are in development that are progressing through early phase uh, human trials. Now, a word on palivizumab, it is um, in some circles considered a controversial agent. And um, it is heavily promoted by its, the company that manufactures it. One of the difficulties of palivizumab is its cost. It is very expensive. And uh, just four or five years ago, across the country, 29 states, uh, their Medicaid program's largest single drug expense was palivizumab. At $1,500 a dose for multiple doses through the winter, it gets very expensive. And so, what, has, what happens periodically, and Dr. Bocchini has been intimately involved with this over the past decade, is, is review of what data is available to tell us and guide us in how really to use palivizumab most effectively given the limited resources that we have for healthcare in terms of healthcare dollars available, right? We don't want to spend money if it's useless, right? So a, a, a similar example, a lot of people like flu mist, data now is that now flu mist is not very effective. And so people have called me and said, well, aren't you still going to have a, a school-based vaccine program for flu? And the answer is, well, no. It doesn't make sense to spend 
millions of dollars to vaccinate kids in schools with flu mist if it's not effective. Okay? So we have to look at safety, efficacy, and cost in uh, making these. If palivizumab was 50 cents a dose, we probably would use it an awful lot more and, as long as it was safe. Okay? So um, some of the data directly out of the technical report uh, that is put out by the AAP is shown here. And in all infants, regardless of gestational age, we know that the hospitalization rate is about five per thousand in the United States. And among term infants, it's a little higher, and that's good because most of all infants are term infants. And when you start to look at subdivisions of premature infants, that, that number really doesn't change until you get significantly down here to less than 29 weeks gestation. Okay? So 6.9, 6 6.3 uh, per thousand, while yeah, those are a little bigger than 5.2 or 5.3 per thousand, their confidence intervals clearly overlap, and uh, the, sig the only significant difference is among infants born at less than 29 weeks gestation. So that's the first place where, um, where we really want to focus our prevention strategies and, and ask, is palivizumab effective at this age group that has the highest hospitalization rates. Um, second area where the hospitalization rates are very high is infants with congenital heart disease, and this is hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease. Infants with chronic lung disease, you can see, especially in the first six months of life, have very, very high rates, almost a hundredfold higher uh, hospitalization rates than the numbers I just showed you for term infants uh, and among low-risk infants in this particular age group, about a tenfold higher risk of hospitalization due to RSV. You can see that those numbers drop off fairly dramatically in the second half of the first year and the second year of life. And once you get, for these uh, chronic lung disease kids, once you get out here into the second year of life, their numbers are not far different than first year of life or first half a year for low-risk infants, and our congenital heart disease babies get, get to the low-risk strategy or low-risk data in the first half year of life at, in, during the second half year. And so the ones we're really worried about here are the chronic lung disease babies throughout the first year and maybe into the second year, the congenital heart disease babies uh, throughout the first year of life, and our less than 29-week gestation babies because they don't get down to our, the rates of, of low-risk infants until the second half of the first year of life, so after six months of age. Okay. First six months, clearly the most important. All right, and um, this is a little more data on a, on a particular study of over 1,000 infants born before 32 weeks gestation, looking at their rates of uh, hospitalizations due to RSV, and I don't remember the context of this, Joe. Do you remember the context? Anyhow, the point here is that we're comparing uh, the, the younger age groups to the 30 to 32 week gestation babies, and the statistically significant ones are those less than uh, 28 weeks of gestation. So 26 weeks gestation and lower clearly have a higher rate here, 13.9% admitted, and a 10% admission rate in the 27 to 28 uh, week gestation babies. So these are clearly the highest risk groups we can identify. Some interesting new data um, from Nepal. This is uh, a large group of folks at uh, Seattle study RSV uh, in, in collaboration with a uh, large international nonprofit called PATH. And um, um, now I can't even remember her name. Jan England's group does a lot of these studies, and you can see how the rates of uh, RSV infection, this isn't hospitalization, this is infection rates per thousand person years uh, in, in preemies is similar to what we see here in this country, much higher for the 28, 29 week gestation babies, and it drops off significantly as you get to uh, full term. <coughs> Ooh, somebody's beeping. All right, so how should we use palivizumab? And this is basically straight out of the recommendations of the um, AP guidelines. In the first year, palivizumab is recommended for infants born before nine weeks, zero days gestation. Palivizumab is not recommended for healthy infants born after that, 29 and zero. In the first year of life, prophylaxis is recommended for preterm infants 
with chronic lung disease or prematurity, and that's defined as birth less than 32 weeks and a requirement for supplemental oxygen for at least 28 days after birth. And, and this, these guidelines are fairly specific about what are the criteria for uh, using palivizumab, again, based on the available data uh, related to its effectiveness. Now, palivizumab doesn't save lives. It prevents hospitalizations. And so that's part of the equation that's getting balanced here in how we use this. Because if it, if it saved life, that would even be better. But the data that's available says it doesn't save lives. It actually just reduces hospitalizations. And uh, clinicians may administer palivizumab in the first year of life to certain infants with hemodynamically significant heart disease. And that, the important statement there is hemodynamically significant. So we're not talking about just a small VSD or ASD, those kind of things. On your board questions, don't be stumped. Just because there's a little VSD, palivizumab is not warranted. Um, maximum of a five monthly doses is recommended during RSV season, and I showed you the, the time course of, of seasons in different areas of the country. They vary a little bit. And remember that infants born during RSV season might need less, fewer doses. You really just have to protect them for the first six months is, per, is where you're going to prevent their hospitalization. So a baby born in January would get a January, February, and March dose and doesn't need five doses because RSV is largely gone uh, by March or April, especially in our area. And prophylaxis is not recommended in the second year of life except for children who are at least, who required that same 28 days of supplemental oxygen after birth and who continue to require medical intervention, either supplemental oxygen, chronic steroids, or diuretic therapy to manage their chronic lung disease. If they're taking those for some other purpose other than their chronic lung disease, that would put them out of the, out of the group that should be uh, receiving palivizumab prophylaxis. Now, how important are uh, how important are the guidelines? Well, they are important in the sense that, um, from a, a resource utilization standpoint, we know that adherence to the guidelines number one is safe and does not lead to increased death among those who don't get palivizumab who might have gotten it in otherwise uh, a cost unrestrained setting. And we know that using the guidelines and changing, even within our own state just a few years ago, from open prescribing to focus on AAP guidelines in just a single year saved the state over $30 million in Medicaid expense uh, by focusing on guidelines. Again, without any um, apparent or, or obvious change in uh, safety for kids. So, the expense of this medication is, is part of why we have to focus on it. We focus on all medicines that are very expensive uh, because we don't want them used really willy-nilly without um, a good evidence to support their use. I mentioned before that RSV can be resistant to palivizumab. About 5% of hospitalized children who've been on palivizumab uh, when they have a breakthrough RSV infection will actually have a resistant strain. And we know that that's related to changes in the amino acid, as we talked about. And the board, the board question is answered here. If a baby has RSV in, uh, hospitalization, even though they're getting palivizumab, do you continue to give them palivizumab? And the answer is no. Okay. And that it would be under the supposition that they have a resistant strain, or it's likely they do. So are there alternatives to palivizumab right now? No. There's one drug that the same company studied called Motivizumab, which showed no benefit over Palivizumab, and we won't talk about that. Um, another company called Regeneron is, um, is, is producing a monoclonal antibody that is uh, directed against RSV, and um, they are exploring its use in preterm infants, at this point preterm infants who don't qualify for Synergis because Synergis is the, is the gold standard, or the standard of care, I would say, not gold standard, standard of care for uh, preemies who qualify for it. So Regeneron's strategy is, well, let's study this drug and its effects in babies who don't qualify for Synergis, so that may be older preemies or uh, 29 to 32-week preemies without congenital heart disease or chronic lung disease. And this study is another one that's uh, active here at our site. We enrolled one infant last year and are open for enrollment in this coming winter. This is a prophylactic strategy and, uh, and so requires a screening period, 
uh, before babies can receive the dose of drug. And this drug has the advantage, perhaps over palivizumab, that its half-life is longer. It's been modified such that one or two doses are going to be adequate to cover a baby through RSV season in any particular area. And so with less frequent dosing and maybe, uh, hopefully, a lower price point, uh, then you may have the ability to, uh, to begin to compete with palivizumab and bring, it, bring its cost down. So as I said, this study is uh, active uh, at, at our site at the present time. RSV vaccines, as I said before, some physicians and scientists have spent their whole careers in frustration trying to develop RSV vaccines. And uh, at current, there are, uh, in, in this report from earlier in the year in the magazine or in the journal Vaccine, over 60 different RSV candidate vaccines in development. Some of them, the tried and true live attenuated, others vectored vaccines or protein-based vaccines, some even nucleic acid vaccines where you use uh, just the DNA itself at, or, or, or RNA as the uh, vaccination piece. And, and it's set up in a way that it actually produces the protein in vivo and your immune system reacts to it. They're gene-based vectors and then some combination, combination strategies as well. Um, if you go to the uh, clinicaltrial.gov website and search for RSV, as I did early this morning, what you'll find is that there are about 220 different studies uh, related to RSV that ha are either completed, shown here with red, or ongoing, and you would see a green label out here, recruiting or whatever their status is. And you can see what some of them are. Here's an RSV vaccine for maternal immunization uh, in the third trimester of pregnancy. Here is uh, a GSK bi biologics vaccine for use in healthy women. Again, pre-pregnancy kind of study to make sure it's safe and efficacious in terms of immune response. Here's an adenovirus uh, vaccine producing an RSV protein as a vaccine strategy. And you know the list goes on and on. This continue this contains the antiviral drugs, some diagnostic testing, but, but many of these are vaccine trials that are ongoing. And, and the point here is that you're going you're gonna to see, we're probably going to have some of these vaccine trials at our own site in the next few years. And within a few years, we're likely going to be using antivirals against RSV in clinical practice, especially among hospitalized babies um, who need just a little extra boost get them out of the hospital more quickly. Uh, here's the snapshot. Uh, it's all fuzzy, but showing you there are a lot of vaccines in preclinical stages. This is an animal testing. Phase one trials, there are uh, almost a dozen. Phase two and three trials, you're talking about two and three different vaccine candidates out in each of those areas. So a, a large clinical pipeline uh, of, of different vaccine strategies against RSV that we're going to be studying over the next few years. So conclusion, you know RSV is common in the winter, and it's most likely to cause severe disease in young infants. Its diagnosis can be made on clinical grounds when you know RSV is in your community. So you don't always have to do an RSV test because for the vast majority of patients, it's not going to change your management. And if your RSV test is negative and they have bronchiolitis, they most likely have what? Metanumovirus, right? Or one of the other viruses. Again, none of which you're going to have an antiviral currently available. Hospitalized infants with suspected RSV should have laboratory confirmation so that we can co cohort them with when it's necessary and, um, and for good infection control purposes. Antiviral agents will be available this winter in clinical trials here. We have both the oral and the inhaled agents that we expect to have online in clinical trials for hospitalized babies. And the new prophylactic strategies, antibodies, and vaccines are also coming down the pipeline um, for infants who are currently outside the guidelines for palivizumab. And a famous quote, remember RSV does not stand for rosefin sensitive virus. Um, this is our, our friend Bob Jackson, uh, pediatric cardiologist. And uh, for those of you who may know Peru, this is the last Inca, and I consider Bob uh, in one of those categories as perhaps the last Inca, uh, a, a great physician. All right, so we'll stop there. Any questions um, about RSV and what we're doing here? We got an um, email earlier this week, and I'm kind of 
vaguely glanced at it because it didn't pertain to the nursery. But that the lab now has an RSV specific test for a couple hundred dollars versus that multiviral panel test that you showed up there for like a thousand dollars and stuff. So what do you, you recommend? So we have heard that there is uh, an antigen detection test being used in the hospital. Uh, even, I don't know, were you? Yeah, they, they, they do a lot of infectious disease testing without talking to infectious disease doctors. Um, you want me to forward it to you? <laughs> yeah, it's likely that, that we're also going to have a, a flu antigen detection test also for use, especially in uh, really point of care, emergency room setting, uh, maybe clinic setting. It's a little more difficult. The ER there. refuses to utilize your fifteen hundred dollar respiratory panel. They yeah, it's not mine. Don't give it to me. <laughs> I just like the data, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, they refuse to use it. They're like, yeah. it's not cost effective. We're not using it. And if the patient's right. being admitted and the admit team wants it for whatever right. reason, right. they can order it. If they're going to go home, they are not ordering it at all. So the yeah. ER doesn't order them at yeah. all. So it right. would be nice to have the. Yeah. The, the single antigen detection test, again, you lose a little bit of sensitivity, but um, those, are, those are fairly good tests. For flu, they're not quite as good because of the variability in the flu strains each year. So we have some caveats there. And, and that's part of the reason we like having the data available because we can monitor and compare how what the, the antigen test is showing compared to what the molecular test is showing. We like to have um, that on academic grounds. But, but you're right. In terms of cost effectiveness, you should scratch your head before you just routinely order the, the comprehensive respiratory panel on every baby with a sniffle. Um, Make sure that you're, you know what you're going to do with the data when you get it. And then speaking of cost, shifting gears a little bit, how many years do they have left on their patent for polyvizumab? <laughs> so that is an important question. But um, it's also, um, well, biologics don't lose patent. Okay. So it's infinite. Consider so it's that. not the... Typical 20-year patent? No, not typical. So any, any of the vaccines that we use, they never go off patent because each one is, has been made in a certain company, in a certain process, that, and, and with a certain end product that can't be reduplicated by anyone else. And so essentially they never lose patent protection. So it will never be any So uh, unless there's competition, there, it's likely that... The, the cost of television map won't change. It's, it's an economic issue at this point. Yes, Dr. Kramer. That was an excellent presentation of an overview. Thank uh, you. I was fascinated by the nanoantibodies mm -hmm. you were talking about in different sites uh, from a drug distribution in the area that we do that a lot in our babies with Sepak and the tons and tons of studies. So, how far does it go? Because you've got you got studies only in healthy volunteers, but you got, uh, you know, kids' airways are different, the transports are different, molecular size, Correct. particle size are different. So has people looked in animals as to, using radio, labeled as to where does it go? Yeah. The major airways or is it going to the smaller airways? So in the, uh, in the lamb model, I didn't show you the, the pathology because they're, they actually have pictures of the lamb lungs on their website. And, and these, these molecules are small enough that they get very deep into the lung tissue, into the deep airways. They're not absorbed systemically, but nor do they need to be. Um, but their, their penetration in the lower airways is very good. And the company, I think, has, has probably invested as much in the aerosolization process as the drug itself, because it is so critical, as you point out. OK, before we leave, um, I'll introduce Lisa Lachele and Molly Linville are two research nurses in the Clinical Research Center. You may see them or me or all of us on the floor. Uh, through the winter, we will uh, be trying to kind of make research rounds uh, with the teams occasionally to help identify patients that may qualify for clinical trials if they're interested. So um, you guys stand up and turn around so I can see your faces. <laughs> all right. These are my right hand and left hand, so be good. All right, thank you.